We need to stop trying to find ourselves. We don't need to go find ourselves. We need to create ourselves. We need to create who we want to be. Once you create who you are, you're that person. Live that life. We might have all the right people, but they might be in the wrong seat. When it comes to a certain skill set, I think it also speaks to your leadership and being able to understand what your vision is for the company. I don't have the vision to see those things, but I can probably more than anyone in that stadium feel the roar of the crowd Everybody has that. You don't have to be blind to have that perspective. And I think it can really give a lot of value to how you go about life and how you make decisions, how you create businesses that are different and stand out from other people. Welcome to The Big Break Show, your go-to podcast for real estate investing, business acquisition, mindset, and lifestyle. Now, let's dive into season two with your hosts, Rafa Loza and Dan Tollins. What's up, everybody? Welcome <laughs> to another very special episode of The Big Break Show, season two. And I am here with my new co-host, Mr. Dan Tollins, and boy, do we have an episode for you today. We're kind of laughing because we've tried this intro like 20 times because it keeps crashing on us. But uh, Dan, what's up, man? How are you today? Man, beautiful day in Carolina Beach. Thanks for asking. Super excited to have Erica James on with us. As I told you, she's a two-time national CrossFit champion, a real estate agent in Greenville, South Carolina, a multiple business entrepreneur, and just all around badass. So can't wait to dive into her story and all the details and a little curveball we've got probably coming a little bit way into the show. What do you think? I, I mean, I'm so happy that she came on to chat with us. This is one of the coolest conversations about just life, mindset, hardships, relationships, entrepreneurial spirit, investing, best conversations that I've ever had. I thought it was a fantastic conversation. I think people are going to love this thing, um, this episode, because, I mean, she's impressive. She is badass. Dude, I mean, two-time yeah. CrossFit champ, real estate investor. Well, that's the beauty about doing this thing, man. We, 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 get, to, we get to learn some stuff along the way. You know, it's just it's going to be fantastic to keep bringing in more and more uh, extraordinary people uh, that have influenced, you know, my life and influenced your life as well. And excited for everybody to hear uh, the stories that are going to be coming down the line. You know, when we first talked about doing season two together, the idea of bringing in people that were like that could have gone pro that decided to go the professional route, business route. Um, didn't know where it was going to go. And after this conversation, man, I'm very excited about it. So I hope all the listeners, I know, well, I don't hope, I know you guys are going to get value out of this. I know you guys are really going to enjoy it. So without further ado, Erica James. All right. Hey guys, we are back with another great uh, episode here of the Big Break Show 2.0. This week, we've got a fantastic guest. And as Rafa has kind of led you guys on to believe this is going to be bigger and better than it used to be. So we want to start this one out uh, and kind of go over a lot of things that involve real estate, but a lot of other things that don't. So uh, I've got my great friend, Erica James, with us, and she is a licensed real estate agent and entrepreneur and also CrossFit world champion. Is that correct? Yep. Yep. Two times. All right. Yeah. Two <laughs> That's times. awesome. All right. Well, thank you for being with us today. And, uh, you know, this, this show is typically about uh, real estate and how you got your big break and all the ways that real estate has changed your life. But uh, with me kind of coming to the show, we're looking to add a little bit more to that as far as uh, talking about, you know, basically uh, life after sports for athletes and then also different obstacles that people have overcome. And then also how real estate has been able to afford to give you the lifestyle that you want. Right. So, um, you know, Erica was here in Carolina Beach last week with her husband, Jake, who's uh, been gracious enough to help me get our ambiance uh, set up here in Carolina Beach and hopefully be back soon. And um, you and Rafa actually have some some stuff in common here because, as you saw, the, the new construction that we're doing, Rafa is hopefully going to be buying at least one side, if not both sides. Uh, and why Erica and Jake were here, they actually looked at a couple of and investment properties for themselves that my daughter got to show them around. So pretty cool. Yeah. We're looking forward to hopefully picking up a property there. Yeah. It'd be, it'd be amazing. So um, I guess what we really wanted to kind of get into, you know, you know, you know my story as far as uh, you know, how we started, you know, out in the, in the, being a builder and doing it for people and then eventually doing it for ourselves and then 
starting to teach people and, you know, Rafa is also teaching folks as well in the, the short-term rental and midterm and arbitrage space. And, uh, you know, last year or year and a half ago, whatever it was, uh, Cassie and I hosted an event here in Carolina beach and we were honored to have you and Jake uh, here. And I'm anxious to kind of hear what you guys have done since then. Yeah. So like you were saying, um, I've been licensed in real estate for about four years now. And when we bought our first property, our primary residence at that time, that was my first deal I had ever done as a real estate agent. And that was about, I guess that was almost four years ago. So when we bought that property, we were in it for maybe six months to a year and saw how much equity we already had in our primary residence. And then we started seeing all the awesome things you and Cassie were doing with flips and long-term rentals, short-term rentals, and it just opened up our possibilities to, okay, real estate doesn't just have to be, I'm an agent, help buyers and sellers. How can we diversify and do other things? So our first dip of the toe was trying a flip property, which we actually partnered with you guys on. And that was really awesome because I feel like Jake and I had to do the boots on the ground, the real work, but we had y'all support and guidance on the back end, which was nice just to have someone to call up when something goes wrong and, you know, it's, it gets stressful. Um, so after that first flip, we did really well on it and realized that even when you come up with like bumps in the road and you feel like it's not going to be a success. You can still be successful with it. Like you can still make money on it. Um, and so we're like, okay, if we're making money on our first one and we really, it was a wobbly rough process. We were just getting our feet under us. Then we think we have like some potential here. So since then, um, total we've done three flips. We're under contract on a fourth right now. Uh, so we close next week on that fourth property. Uh, and then we've also been able to transition and kind of use some of our primary residences to, we've turned, so for example, we turned our first primary residence into a long-term rental and bought another primary residence. And we got really lucky on that second primary uh, because it actually was in this like special place in Greenville, South Carolina, where we live, where it was like this tiny little piece of land that didn't have any short-term rental restrictions on it. It was in the county. Everything else around it uh, is zoned for the city, which Greenville and the city of Greenville has a lot of restrictions there. So uh, we were we saw the potential in that, picked it up as a primary residence first. And then after we lived in that one for a while, we were like, okay, let's transition this one into maybe the short-term rental. So we have two Airbnbs now, that property, we turned them into Airbnbs. It had a main house and a guest house on the property. So we were able to turn it into two um, and brought another primary residence. And uh, it's kind of been a fun way to go about it. And it's been really beneficial too. So we've kind of dabbled in all of it. We've done flips, long-term and short-term. Well, you've also, um, so you kind of touched a little bit on you know, how mentoring works and, and kind of taking action. And I think one of the most uh, prideful things for myself and for Cassie was that, you know, we were able to kind of work with you guys hand in hand on that process and introduce you to the hard money guy and introduce you to, you know, how to, you know, go about advertising on your own. Cause I know when, when we last talked, you know, you guys are just simply putting stuff on Facebook of what it is you're looking for. And you've gotten four or five, like really, really good hot leads that nobody else has, uh, has seen. So uh, I thought it was really cool that you guys, we did one together and then you guys just took off and went from there. And, you know, the other thing was figuring out how to just not just keep going into the flipping side, but being able to actually uh, buy a commercial property as well for uh, your business. So I'd like to, to, to touch base on, on the booty shop. Tell us a little bit about what that does and where you guys are going from there and, and where do you see, you know, that going? Yeah, the commercial property has been really cool um, that we're been able to secure that and kind of renovate that for the other business that I own, which is the booty shop. Uh, the booty shop is a female uh, fitness studio, uh, but we also serve alcohol there. So we call ourselves a fitness bar and um, we've been open for almost five years now. And it's really uh, a great place for women specifically to come work out. It's all class-based, so we offer 
all different types of workouts. You know, in a fitness studio, traditionally, you only get one style of workout, whether it's like a yoga studio or a bar studio. And with my personal training and fitness background, I just understood the value in being able to have so many different types of workouts in your arsenal or kind of like in your week uh, to give you a well-rounded routine. So I created the fitness studio, the booty shop to have five different styles of classes from HIIT training to strength training to those low impact classes that we all need, um, like bar yoga and a hip hop dance class, which is really fun. So with that, on top of the like bar aspect of it. Women get to come work out and then they get to hang out, drink a mimosa, drink a cup of coffee if they don't want alcohol. Uh, And it really just creates community and it's taken off, um, gosh, since day one, it's taken off and it's been really successful. So uh, when we first opened, we secured just a commercial lease downtown Greenville um, because with any new business, you know, you, you don't have any cash, you don't have any stability. It's really just a startup at that point. So We did that first, got a great spot on Main Street, downtown Greenville. I've built it up there and now have had the opportunity to um, buy a building downtown Greenville that will be ours. And we're currently renovating it now. And uh, yeah, we'll be moving the booty shop location into that new building sometime this summer. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the beauty about, you know, entrepreneurship. And, uh, you know, like like you said, you were leasing a place and I know that you're Landlord pretty much was like, hey, your lease is coming up, and uh, we think that the rent should double. Uh, yep. <laughs> and, you know, which which for you guys, you know, you were, you were you know, comfortable where you were, right, and as comfortable with what your budgets were. And all it took was that one little nudge uh, for you guys to say, you know what, what, what's, what are the other possibilities, and how can we make this happen? And I know we've had numerous conversations over the last year about, you know, trying to make that happen for you guys and, you know, whether it was something we got involved in or something you guys were able to pull off by yourselves. And uh, it's just absolutely remarkable. Um, what are some things that you kind of envision? Is this something that you would want to uh, expand in your market there in Greenville? Or is it something that you think, you know, you might be able to take into different markets throughout the Southeast? So can, can I can I cut you guys off for a second? Sorry, guys. So I, I want to I'm really curious about the booty shop first before we get into the expansion of it and like the commercial stuff. If you don't mind, Dan, is, is it cool if I kind of cut you off there, buddy? Well, you know, I, I thought you were over there taking a nap, honestly. <laughs> OK, so to be fair, you know how, how Erica, you told you how in the beginning it bugs out. You kept freezing on me and I'm like, dude, I'm missing like portions of the conversation. So I was like, gosh, darn it. I was like, I was going to ask a question and Dan's already speaking already. So I'm like delayed on this side. I don't know what's going on. That's that Boost Mobile, man. Dude, I'm telling you, man, I got to fix this internet situation. I don't understand what's going on with it. But um, (laughs) talk to me a little bit about how you came up with that idea and the theory behind it, because I've never heard of a concept like that. Dude, listen, I'd love to work out. And if I if like I go in my area, I'll go do these three mile run things at breweries so that we can get a beer afterwards. Right. So if I go to my CrossFit gym and at the end of it, they go, dude, we're going to smoke a cigar and drink some old fashions after this badass workout. Like, dude, I'm going to work out because now I have the reward instantly the moment it ends. Right. So where did you come up with this? I think this is awesome. (laughs) Thank you. Well, you know, what's funny is the simple answer is just that I, I loved working out and I loved not just drinking, but the community that having a drink, whether it's a cocktail or a cup of coffee can bring. And I recognize because I was in the fitness industry as a personal trainer and just teaching like group fitness classes around Greenville, um, I was able to recognize that like people were packing out my classes. They loved what I was doing, but as soon as they came in, did their class, they left. And I'm like, wait, how do I get these people to stick around? Like I want more from them than just, just to do my class, you know? So I just combined the two things that I loved. I'm like, if I love working out and having a drink, then I'm sure other people are going to love that too. And I knew that my, my clientele was going to be women like me. So it felt like it was going to work. And luckily it did. <laughs> Dude, I, I mean, I, I got to tell you, I think that's genius. I, I like I so just in case you don't know, I do CrossFit, right? So just regular workouts. I don't compete or anything like that. But I've been doing it for, I don't know, 15 years or something on and off. And every time I go, to, I've been to maybe five different boxes. And um, every time I go to these gyms, it's... Um, it's most people at every single location, it becomes like their clicks and they hang out with their own things. And then the gym tries to do these like weekend, hey, we're going to go get drinks. But really, the people that only show up are the people that have already built that community. 
And then you have people that want to kind of get involved, but are intimidated to be involved. It's kind of like a networking event, right? For real estate. You have people that show up and they're kind of in the corner, they're shy, they sit by themselves. But the fact that you can have something immediately, hey, listen, don't leave. I already poured you up a mimosa. Pull on up, get up to the counter. And now you start talking to four different people and now you start working out. I mean, retention for for the gym, number one, stays because people are are now working out with friends. They get to know each other. Mm -hmm. They're getting a workout in, and then the reward is they can have, you know, some some might say a guilty pleasure of a quick drink before they go on yeah. with their day. Dude, I love this. This yeah. is this is genius, Eric. I, dude, this is awesome. I'm excited <laughs> about this. So uh, anyway, yeah. yeah. All right. So I appreciate you diving into that a little bit. Um, let's go back to Dan's question here. What are your plans for expansion? What are you guys planning on doing? I'd love to hear more on that. So we... I- Ever since I started Booty Shop, I knew I wanted it to be, I knew I had the potential to be something bigger than just one location. So I've always like had that thought process. And in the beginning, I wasn't sure if it would be a franchise model or a corporately owned model. Um, There's obviously pros and cons to both. Um, At one point, I thought franchise might be better because it requires less cash. It requires less staff on my side. Um, you kind of just sell your brand to other people who you believe can go and open other locations, right? Um, but after doing more research and really just growing Booty Shop here to exactly what I want it to be, I'm almost too protective to go the franchise route at least right away. So I have a list of 25 to 30 people who have already inquired about franchising the Booty Shop, and I just tell them I'm putting them on the list. Um, I'm not quite there yet. I really want to like corporately own, privately own at least two more in other markets that are similar to Greenville. So places on my target would be like Charleston, South Carolina, Charlotte, North Carolina, um, suburbs of Atlanta, like Buckhead, um, places like that, that are like growing cities like Greenville, very trendy cities have a like fun, like young professional demographic, um, I think that that's probably our next step is open one or two more on our own and then see where to take it from there. Um, but what's cool is I've also been dabbling into other types of businesses that could branch off of the booty shop brand that might not be brick and mortar studios, but are still like fitness studio adjacent. Um, so I've been working on different stuff like that, whether it's products or um, subscriptions, things like that. That's all in the works. And then right now we're currently um, about to release a retreat um, and it's going to be something that we do every single year. It's going to be like an international retreat. I'm calling it a wellness retreat, but it's going to be like the booty shop spin on a wellness retreat. Uh, which means there's going to be a lot of balance there. So we're not just going to be finding ourselves, you know, we're going to be working out and working on our goals, but we're also going to be being very social and having fun things, fun activities to do. So that retreat is another part of the business that I'm really excited about and about to launch uh, in like two weeks. I think that's a great idea. I think the the retreat thing could, could definitely uh, get you to, more of an intimate type of relationship with with not just your members but with different people. You can get them definitely involved in the fitness world as well. Um, what what are what are some of the ideas that you have aside from the retreat? I, I, do you have like a clothing brand along the booty shop? I, I, that seems like a really cool clothing brand as well. We have like merch that we sell with our brand on it, so I wouldn't necessarily call it like a clothing brand, but it's branded clothes that we do sell. Um, but I haven't tried to sell that outside of just the studio. Um, our signature thing is mimosas after class. Everybody gets a complimentary mimosa after class and then they can buy like whatever else they want after that. So since we're kind of mimosa heavy, I've really been researching into the champagne and Prosecco brands and thinking about how I could do something along those lines. Um, because I think that products like that could sell outside of just a studio. Um, so that's kind of where my brain's been at. What can sell and stand on its own, uh, but still be like the cool branding of the booty shop. Cause truly the branding of the booty shop is half of the reason why it's so successful. Yeah. I love that. That's very, very cool. Uh, I think we've got a couple of people, uh, one in my household, uh, and then, a couple of folks that you just spent a week with last week that could uh, 
would love to be uh, helping that research process. One hundred percent. Right. Yeah. yeah. We'll all go to like France and Italy and do some taste testing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I want to shift gears a little bit here. Uh, Erica, I'd love to talk about your CrossFit journey uh, as an athlete. Uh, and again, part of part of what we're trying to, to talk to folks about and, and some of our audience that I'm bringing in, there's um, folks that are former athletes like myself who played uh, collegiately and could have could have went and played pro, but chose to get into the professional world sooner. So trying to help folks figure out how to find their niche. And I think part of that is having the discipline that it takes to, um, you know, really hone in on your craft and whether that's, you know, working for somebody, someone or being an entrepreneur or having a side hustle or whatever. So um, I just kind of want to dive into what your, your daily regimen or your daily disciplines really look like. Um, that make it so much that seems so easy for you to continue to win. Yeah. Um, so like you mentioned, I compete in CrossFit and, um, I've always been an athlete. So in college, I was a cheerleader at Clemson university, um, with a scholarship there. And then after college, I just joined the professional world. I got a, you know, pretty normal nine to five job working at a nonprofit, Um, so that was my first job out of college and I was really left feeling the way a lot of people I think feel who are athletes, especially collegiate athletes. You're like, so what now? Like, what do adults do to stay competitive or to still get that feeling with a nine to five job? In my case, that wasn't doing it for me. So I had to look other places. Um, so I started running, like I was like, okay, people do like five K's. I guess I could start with that. Um, and that running journey kind of led me to CrossFit. When I found CrossFit, I realized my skills were a lot more aligned with CrossFit and I started to become pretty competitive early on. Um, and so I found that sport and, and that kind of gave me an outlet. Um, but I think that people, I think there's so much like value to having something. If it's not your job right now, then find something outside of your job that kind of like invigorates you and gives you that edge. Because I know that when I was working my nine to five job, that wasn't really fulfilling me. I was just doing it for money at the time. I'd found, you know, my athletic career in CrossFit, running first and then CrossFit. Um, Honestly, that, that kind of invigorated me and gave me some like confidence to then step away from my full-time job and take some risks in life um, as far as like financial risk, becoming an entrepreneur and those types of things. So I kind of think they go hand in hand. And I think there's a lot of value to that. Uh, I also think there's a lot of value to not having your like full identity wrapped up into one thing. Um, I, I think if all I did was the booty shop and that was like the only thing that I was passionate about, I would get really burnt out really easily or, I would have my whole identity tied up into that. And then what happens if I ever sell that one day or um, something happens to that business? So I think there's a lot to having, whether it's a hobby or a sport or another thing that you try to become really good at, um, just diversifying your skill sets because they all help each other. So there's something that, Dan, you know what's funny, Dan? We need to come up with some sort of sign so that we can know when we don't talk over each other because we're going to be doing this a ton because I have a bunch of questions right now. So, but, um, so there's, there's something I, I <laughs> that, that works. Raise your hand. So there's something that I, that I want to bring up and I don't know. Maybe I'm just kind of like spitballing here, but is there some sort of correlation between like the discipline of sports? Cause CrossFit's not an easy sport, right? Um, and, and some, most gyms, the, the majority of the cross, CrossFit workouts are five in the morning to around 10 and then they shut down and they have to come in the afternoon when people are getting off of work. But the majority of the people work out in the morning. So the point I'm getting at here, is there some sort of correlation or something that aligns with the discipline of and and being, being I guess, in the sport or doing any sort of physical activity that aligns with the business world and your entrepreneurial world? I've been doing a lot of thinking about this where one of the things I wanted to do was kind of like an Iron Man or something that de- requires a ton of discipline because I'm not very disciplined. You know, as much as I say I am, I, I kind of tend to go in a hundred different directions and I lose track of certain things. Um, I, I don't know. Tell me your thoughts here. Has Have you noticed or have you put any thoughts behind that? Do you get where I'm going with this behind behind For the sure. idea? Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I definitely. So for my personal self, 
for sure, 100%. Like, I think that pushing myself in the gym and, and being able to do really hard things there helps me whenever I run into really hard things in my business or really hard things in life. Um, and vice versa, you know, if you're really great at business and you're good at taking risks, then you're going to come up against challenges. Like that's just part of it. And so if you're already good at that, then you're going to be able to push yourself really hard in a workout, in a fitness class. Um, your brain and your body is going to really like that daily pressure because I just feel, feel like it, it pushes you to be a little bit better. It pushes you to figure out how to get past obstacles, not necessarily physically, but mentally. So you were talking about how you had a nine to five after school and uh, then you really kind of found your passion or you know, what you were you know, able to kind of be at peace with yourself was through athletics and becoming an athlete. And, you know, how has that kind of led you to just kind of going through business and knowing that, you know, working for someone versus working, you know, with a partner or for yourself, um, you know, what, what are some of the kind of the, the mental things that have helped you kind of switch from, again, working for somebody to just why not take a chance and, and work for yourself and invest for yourself. And, uh, you know, knowing that if it doesn't work out, you're going to be 10 steps ahead of, of where you would have been, um, you know, stuck just working for corporate. Yeah, I think our realization, and I say our, because my husband and I, uh, we weren't married at the time, we were just dating, but we kind of came to this realization together, and it really took both of us uh, figuring it out to, I think, help me realize I could do that, I could quit my job and, and really take a chance on myself. Um, so what happened was I we were living in Charleston at the time, and I got a... Uh, I was being recruited from another nonprofit located in Greenville where we currently live. Uh, it was for $5,000 more a year, like only $5,000 more. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to pick up my life and move to Greenville for $5,000 more a year. Like right. <laughs> it was wow. wild. Um, my husband at the time was working a job in Charleston that he absolutely hated. So he was like, well, I'm just going to move too. Um, I'll move with you. I don't have a job lined up, but I'll still just come and figure it out. So I had a stable new job here in Greenville, South Carolina, and Jake was able to kind of figure out his own stuff. So he started like his own um, video production company. And, and once he got his legs under him, um, I got to see you know, from my daily nine to five, I got to kind of see that he was doing his own thing. You know, he was taking risks. Sometimes there was no money. Sometimes there was good money. Um, but it was a roller coaster that I was witnessing. Yes, but he was loving what he was doing and it was giving him so much more like life and purpose. So once he got a little bit more stable with that, I was 100% sold on stepping away from my nine to five. Uh, and going down the same path of entrepreneurship, um, honestly, just because I didn't love what I was doing. Uh, I was working at a nonprofit, uh, working with people with disabilities, which is like one of my biggest passions in life. So I loved the mission behind what I was doing, but the um, like admin daily, just sitting at a desk work, I just knew was like totally underselling my skill set. So it was an easy decision once, uh, you know, he was able to offer me a little bit more stability. I stepped away and was able to kind of take some risks on starting my uh, journey in the fitness industry. And it's kind of cool because, I, you know, I've as I got secure in the fitness industry, I was then able to uh, staff the booty shop completely. I have a full-time manager there, 17 instructors there. Um, and that gave me the ability to dive into real estate full time. So I've really just been able to, um, you know, take, take building block steps, uh, to be where I am now. And it's been a cool process to look back on. So th that's pretty cool because, uh, really quick down something I want to put in here is <laughs> you were, you went from, uh, <laughs> That was funny. You went, you went from being just a, a someone that was working out to opening your own gym, and now you fully automated that gym with the right team, the right members, the right management. Uh, can you just touch a little bit on that? Because something that I'm really big on is trying to build the right teams, and sometimes some work out, sometimes don't. 
Sometimes you find people that are decent, et cetera, et cetera. How, how has that been for you really quick? Just a really quick like overview of it. Yeah. Yeah. I think it can be different depending on what type of business you're trying to create. Um, luckily the booty shop was a brick and mortar, you know, physical business and brand that I was able to develop from the ground up. And so, um, when I was initially staffing, I was really, I was managing it and teaching most of the classes. And I really, at the beginning, just hired a few instructors instructors in the fitness industry really just work part-time. So I was able to quickly weed out the people who weren't in line with like the culture and the environment I was trying to create. Um, and the ones that were really good, I, I picked up on that because I was there every single day grinding right alongside them. And so I totally just promoted from within once I was able to work myself out and give my other instructors who are really great more hours and more responsibilities um, that's exactly what I did. So my full-time manager right now, um, started off as one of my day one instructors at the booty shop. And I'm super proud of that. So to kind of touch on that, um, well, let's backtrack a little bit, talk about, well, so Jake is also Rafa, you, you haven't had a chance to spend much time with Jake yet, but Jake played college football. Um, and then she was a, a college football cheerleader of rally cat if that's the, the right name right and so i think it's pretty cool to have two people trying to find you know their path and their separate journeys but together being together and pulling for each other because so many people uh you know they might have someone who's way less uh risk oriented or risk risk tolerance and so that can kind of hold you back, uh, as opposed to rooting for one another the whole way. Um, and then when it comes to your, your, your staff or your team and automating things, I think for things that we have found is we might have all the right people, but they might be in the wrong seat, right? Like you might have a, like for us that with, with the hotels we have, um, trying to put them all together. We've got a guy who's great at maintenance. Uh, but when it comes to like, Hey, let's have him putting furniture together. Let's have him doing all these things that are not really in his skill set, right? He's more of, Hey, I go change a light bulb. I can go pick up trash or do all these different things. But when it comes to a certain skill set, I think it's also speaks to, you know, your leadership and being able to understand what your vision is for the company and being able to kind of shuffle people around and knowing what the potential are to be able to move them from instructor to, you know, elevate it up, you know, and be part of the executive team. Yeah. And I've tried to really like, I think there's something to being in, in their shoes before and knowing what that feels like. I know that, you know, earlier in my career, like it felt terrible. I, I, I like to be good at what I'm doing. Um, and when I'm good at what I'm doing, I love what I'm doing. And so like, if I was ever in a role or ever given like a job, that I wasn't good at, that just wasn't in line with my skill set. I didn't want to do it. And then ultimately I'm not being used to like my best ability. So I think whenever you can recognize that, um, you're able to then set your people up for success, right? You're, you don't want them to be doing anything that they're not good at, that they don't want to do. Right. Yeah. That's key. That's huge. So can you talk a little bit about how you decided to get into competing and how that was just your journey in that, that world? Oh, yeah. Um, so this might kind of bring up my personal story. Um, so I don't know if y'all want me to like dive into that yet. Please, by all uh, means, we, we wanted to bring it up anyway. So if it ties in, well, we have some questions around that. So go ahead. Okay. So um, I, I started competing in, uh, in sport, like I was telling you guys after college and just trying to like, find out what adults do to be competitive. But I was running up against a couple of barriers because I have a really unique personal story. Um, when I was six months old, I was diagnosed with a pediatric cancer in my eyes. And so uh, between my two eyes, I had 14 tumors and went through radiation treatment in both my eyes um, when I was a child. So um, even though I've been cancer free since like the age of five, I am now experiencing progressive vision loss from that radiation because uh, it's just really damaging to the body. So I've been experiencing that my entire life and uh, it's kind of been a slow burn, but I've had 
times in life, like specifically around my high school and college years where my vision declined tremendously um, to the point of like legal blindness and then even past that. Um, So when I was an adult trying to get into fitness, I realized, oh, it's not safe for me to run in a mass race by myself. Like I'm, I'm hitting people, I'm tripping over the curbs, like just stuff like that. Um, so as my vision got worse and worse, I found adaptive sport, which is sport for people with disabilities. And, um, because I am visually impaired, legally blind, um, I, I qualify for those types of, um, fitness, like workouts and those types of sports. And so, um, I realized that I, there's, you know, mainstream sports like, running and CrossFit have adaptive sports. And so that really gave me uh, the ability to be competitive in a safe way instead of, you know, doing a CrossFit workout up against people who can see and I'm at a disadvantage because I can't find my dumbbell every time I have to go back and snatch it. Uh, I'm competing against other women who have similar vision to me and we're on an even playing field. So that's how I found adaptive CrossFit. Um, That's how I found CrossFit was just through adaptive sport And, uh, I competed in the CrossFit open for the first time three months after I found CrossFit. And, uh, that was my first winning season. So that was two years ago. Uh, and then I, I proceeded to win last year as well. And I am in the process of my third season right now. We just finished the open and I've qualified for semifinals. That's awesome. So there's a lot Which to unwrap. She's on her way to her 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 third title in a row. So yep, <laughs> hopefully. <That's awesome. laughs> What's cool is I've seen the adaptive sports community grow. Um, in my first year of winning CrossFit, which was like two and a half years ago. Um, the field wasn't very wide. You know, I think I was competing against maybe 20 other women across the world. Um, but this past year, the field size like quadrupled. Um, and then this year the field size has reached over like, I don't know, 200, 300 women. So, uh, it's been cool to see other women who are visually impaired finding the sport, finding athletics in general. Um, and it makes it more competitive and harder on me. So I truly feel like I have to earn that spot every single year. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's, there's something I want to ask you. And so I, I have a few questions. Okay. Um, number one, the hardships you have to go through, um, because of your vision, right. How that's affected you and how that's made you kind of stronger and going back to that, tying everything together from the discipline part. Now let's talk about the hardship part of what you have to go through to sports, to business, to real estate, to all this other fun stuff. Can you touch on that for a bit? Because I, 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 I kind of want to kind of get an understanding of how that was for you and then kind of see where we can take it from there. That'd be okay. Yeah. Yeah, cool. for sure. Um, as far as hardships go, uh, with growing up with vision loss, I, it sounds so trivial, but like from a young age, it was, uh, the hardest part was like, I was always against the social norm. Like obviously the social norm is having both your eyes and being able to see with 2020 vision. I never had that. Um, and I was always, it was always getting more and more apparent Um, So in my younger years, I could kind of cover up the facts that I couldn't see as well. Um, But then as my vision started declining more and more, like it became apparent to other people around me. So then people realized, oh, there's something quote unquote wrong with her. Um, And so I think the hardest part was realizing that I had to like develop the self-confidence in myself even though other people might see me as weaker or less than or different, it really forced me to create that self-confidence. And I'm so glad that it did because that I think is what has led me to be successful in things that, you know, I've, I've found interest in like business and sports and all those things. And um, it helps in so many different ways. You know, I do a lot of like, motivational talks, um, specifically to, to people with disabilities, but it's so cool to talk about, like, it's, it goes so far beyond self-love. It's like true, take, like truly taking pride in your disability, or if you don't have a disability, taking pride in like whatever makes you different, because that unique perspective can be really used as an asset 
but you don't see it that way at first. You have to really train your mind to see it that way. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask is, you know, it's so, you know, invigorating to be around you. Uh, you know, last week when you guys were, were here, it was just uh, Cassie and I just can't get enough of hanging out with you and Jake. And it's just so, uh, like I say, just invigorating when, when you're here. It's not like there's just this, there's no this victim mentality. It's not anything like that. It's just this continual, you know, positive mindset and, you know, going to do whatever it takes and having a good time. And, you know, if something gets in your way, you just figure out the, the best way to go around and, and beat it. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah, I think that's just been the beautiful thing so far through this, this story is you would have no idea that you've had to, you know, not just overcome something one time. It's been your entire life. You know, this is your daily life that you go through, uh, with such a great mindset and, and a great attitude. Um, you know, that, that, like, like you've just told your, your story. It's just amazing. Yeah. I learned from a really young age that, um, people, I use this in business a lot too. People are sheep, right? They're going to go where you tell them to go. They're going to believe what you tell them to believe. And so if you feel like you are a victim or if you feel like you are less than others because you're different, then they're going to see you that way. That's going to exude in like everything you do. Um, I learned that really young. And so thankfully I was able to like figure out, okay, well then the opposite has to be true. If I'm confident, if I'm truly okay with myself and my differences, then everyone else will feel okay about it too. And then they won't be scared to ask me questions about it. And they won't feel embarrassed if like I trip or stumble over something, you know? Um, so it really is a lot about like accepting it and, uh, spinning it to work for you. You know, there's, there's, um, a, a lot to be said around that stuff that you're talking about now, because, you know, there's people with disabilities who do have this, this, um, victim mentality because they're kind of had to experience that their entire life. Right. And it's so true as well for people without disabilities, who just have a victim mentality and we're all ultimately, we're all humans. Right. And we all get to look at and live our lives in the perspective that we see ourselves. Right. I love what you said about that. Right. You learn that early on. It, it's gotta be true. Right. I, I, there's gotta be a way for me to just get, get move past this, get, continue my life and nothing can hold me back. A lot of people, Eric, I got to tell you, a lot of people might, might have been like, oh, man, I have this problem and I can't get past this problem and this situation and this issue. And now this is where I'm at and this is all I'll ever be known for. And I mean, we've been talking to you for, what, 40 minutes now, you know, close to an hour. And everything that you've been talking about is like the ideas you come up with. Right. The, the, the gym situation. I'm still like, wow. Right. You're booty shopping. Like, that thing's awesome. <laughs> yeah. And it has nothing to do with, with your disability at all. Like, had we not brought it up at the end of, of, of this 40 minute conversation, nobody would have even known. You know what I'm saying? You get the, the point what I'm getting at here? Yeah. I want to really thank you guys for that, because I appreciate that. Like, that wasn't the first thing that you guys brought up. It's like, she's blind. Look what she did. It's really like, okay, she's, she does all this like any other person could do. And she's also blind, you know, I like to also always tell people it's like one part of who I am. It's not like everything. And, and what I do is in spite of blindness, it's along with blindness, you know, so it's cool. I appreciate you guys. No, I, I mean, I appreciate you being on here and sharing your story. This is, this is a, a great episode. Uh, I mean, I'm still very like, I, I want to keep talking about the gym, how you got into competitive sports. I mean, I think we've talked a lot about that stuff. We talked about your personal story. Now, Dan, I don't know if you want to keep uh, any more questions around those, those topics here, but I'm really intrigued about your real estate journey. Cause you did say you had a couple of short term rentals and that's my bread and butter. That's Dan's bread and butter with yeah. the hotels. I, I mean, do you want to shift the conversation? What do you guys want to do here? I want to talk about real estate. Well, yeah, yeah. let's do it. So why don't you talk a little bit about that? I mean, how did you transition? I mean, I know you already touched on it, so you don't have to go back into the point, right? But how did you transition into wanting yeah. to do all these bigger projects? I mean, now you're buying a commercial building. A lot of people don't, they, they'll get into short-term rentals. I mean, I do the opposite. I got into a, a commercial and then I went back to, to residential. So I, I want you to kind of touch yeah. on that a little bit, if you don't mind, and where your plans are with, with, yeah. uh, with the real estate stuff. Yeah. Well, I think we, I say we, cause my husband and I, my husband does a lot of the um, investing side of real estate with me. We saw the power of real estate from just me becoming an agent at first. 
um, and from being friends with Dan and Cassie and really seeing all the stuff that they do. So we're like, we know there's a lot of power here. We know that there's a lot of like channels you can go down. And we really have just been spending the first, I mean, now like three-ish years figuring out what's our favorite. So we really just dabbled. Um, we, we did one long-term rental and kind of liked that. Um, it gave us a ton of, we built so much equity in that property just in the two years we, we held on to it. Uh, and then we sold it and, and rolled that money into another project. But that gave us an experience with a long-term rental. Um, now we have the two Airbnbs and that's kind of our like chance just to dabble with short-term rentals. And those are going really well. We're really enjoying it. We're figuring out um, a lot about being short-term rental hosts and what it takes, um, the pros and cons to that. Um, so, yeah, I know that's y'all's bread and butter. I don't know if y'all want to go any more into, like, short-term specifically um, or, like, flips. Because flipping is – I would say flipping houses is where, like, my husband and I's passion is. And that's where we make the majority of, like – big chunks of money. And we really like that part of our business. So, you know, in real estate, you have short term money, mid term money and long term money, right? I look at flipping as the short term active income. I look at my short term rentals. Some people might look at that as short term rental as short term income as well. I look at it as long term income because uh, it's to me, it's pretty passive. Right. And so or I guess we could call it mid term income because long term income would be the equity being built into these properties that you can have an exit strategy and just kind of cash out when you're ready to cash out. But let's talk about that for a second, because you're saying you enjoy the active income, right, which is the flipping side of things. You enjoy that midterm income, which is your short term rentals. And then you are you had a long term rental. So what's your long term income strategy at this point? Honestly, um, really right now, building equity in the properties that we have. Um, Greenville is growing like crazy. I don't know how familiar your audience is or you guys are in Greenville, South Carolina. Um, we are one of the top three like places to visit in the U.S. right now. We are like number one in places to retire last year. Um, we're just hitting all these like top of the charts lists. And so it's um, really making our city boom and grow. Um, so we're building so much equity in the properties that we're holding on to right now, which has been really cool. Um, but yeah, like I would say that's probably the long term side. Right now we're really enjoying the short term um cash flow side of, of the flipping just because we're enjoying it. Like we have fun doing those. And so um we like to kind of diversify and have a little bit of eggs in both of those baskets. Um another thing though, which is pretty cool, um, going back to the commercial property, that one is gonna be really special because we we we're buying this commercial property. We've already bought it. Um, we're renovating it. So we're updating it, um, adding value to it. We're going to own the asset. Booty shop is going to rent it from us. So that's going to be, you know, Smart. super sustainable. And we already have a built in commercial tenant for our commercial building that uh, we get to own and enjoy the benefits of down the road. I love that. Do you, do you, uh, how big is this, is this commercial building? And, uh, how much of the square foot are you going to take for, for the booty shop and then the other tenant that you have? What it, like, I'm, I'm kind of curious as to how you're structuring these. Yeah. So um, right now we're going off of, it's the exact same size. It's 3,400 square feet. Um, so pretty large. Um, it has the possibility down the road. If we ever didn't want to use it for booty shop, we wanted to rent it out. It's two levels. So it has the possibility to be rented into two separate spaces if we wanted to. Right now, while the booty shop's in there, the booty shop will be taking up the whole building. Um, and we are just renting it to booty shop for like $20 a square foot. Uh, so I think it ends up being like roughly $7,000-ish a month, um, which will cover the payment and keep a little bit in there. You know, not a ton of cash flow from booty shop, um, but a little bit every month. And then just have some money in reserves for, you know, repairs and all that fun stuff. And appreciation. Yeah. yeah. Appreciation. The appreciation is going to be huge because our building is in an epic location, downtown Greenville. I'm so excited about it. Yeah, it's exciting. If I'm ever in Greenville, I'm going to stop by. So we're getting to the top of the hour here. Dan, any, any final questions before we shift here to our, uh, our uh, question segment? No, I think it's, as the listeners or viewers have seen, uh, there's so many different streams uh, of, of income that are coming in here, whether it's B3 real estate or business or business acquisitions. 
uh, service-based business, uh, all the things that, you know, Rafa and I uh, are really, you know, trying to push out to folks and things that we're personally concentrating on as far as acquiring businesses and, and you know, hotels and uh, just, just a, a, you know, menagerie of multiple ways to uh, to generate income for yourself and anything uh, that you can think of or that you have interest in. Uh, there's just so many different possibilities to uh, to make make these make all the ends meet, right? Yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, Erica, you know, we we call the show the Big Break Show because we always want to find out what was your big break. Do you have a defining moment that you can point to? Now, some people have multiples; that's fine. But what's the biggest one that you think you might have? If you have one, that was your big break that got you to where you're at today. So I'm gonna. Uh go pretty far back, like even before my, my professional career. Um, my big break was definitely in like my defining moment that changed the tra- trajectory of my life. Um, when I was in high school, I was losing a considerable amount of vision <clears throat> and, um, all of a sudden, you know, I was walking around the halls and, my friends would be, I I heard people saying things like, Erica is so rude. Like what's going on with her? She's not waving at us. When I waved her in the hallway, she's not like coming to sit with us at lunch. Like something's going on. Um, you know, they, they had all these like negative perceptions of me because of that. And it was because I wasn't telling them about my vision loss. I was like trying to hide that part of me. Um, it was creating so many problems for me. So literally my, my big break, I would say, is when I finally accepted, like, what was different about me and started using it to my advantage. You know, I started telling people about my vision loss and then they didn't care. You know, that was the thing was once I accepted it, everyone else accepted it. Um, and that is when I really went down that, like, self-confidence journey. And it, it totally changed because I could have just been you know, hidden and a recluse for the rest of my life and uh, timid and, you know, not very confident. And I guarantee I would not be where I am today if I would have went down that path. So I I love you sharing that because it kind of ties back to what we were talking about a a few minutes earlier, right? How you just continue your life with or without it, right? And so I'm curious as to how you, you, I don't know if I want to call it, got the strength to share it or, but what made you realize, hey, I just need to tell people what's happening and regardless of, you know, what they think of this. It was literally that. It was like, I'm a very social person. Like, I love people. I love being social, um, even back in high school. And so when people started thinking that I was being weird or I was, like, antisocial or I was being rude, I it, it, something just flipped in me. I was like, I can't have people writing this narrative about me. That's not true. Like, I need to take control of my narrative and what I'm putting out into the world and uh, who knew that that would that like tiny realization back then about my vision loss would also translate into everything I do now, whether it's business or real estate or what I put out on social media and so many things. So, Erica, t- tell us an actionable step for the listeners. We always like to kind of give something back to, you know, some, somebody spent an hour listening to us. We want to add a little value to their lives if they haven't already gotten it to this point, which I'm sure they have because this conversation has been awesome. Um, but what's an actionable step or something that you recommend the listeners and viewers to kind of do the moment they hit a stop on this episode today? I think my, my biggest thing and what I want people to take, because it can be applied into anything that you're, you're doing, whether it's, you're wanting to become an entrepreneur, you're wanting to take a risk in your career, you're wanting to get healthy and fit. Um, it's the idea of, we need to stop trying to find ourselves. Like we don't need to go find ourselves. We need to create ourselves. We need to create who we want to be. And then once you create who you are, like you're that person, live that life, take, you know, take the risk your ideal person would take, um, do the things your ideal person would do every day. And then you, all of a sudden you stumbled upon this beautiful life that you love. You know how much I love what you just said right now about creating yourself and not finding yourself? I, I Man, this conversation is awesome. It, it, <laughs> I mean, dude, you know, we can be whatever we want at any moment we want to do it. Yep. Yep. We should just stop the episode right there. Everybody should just stop listening, right? Like, that's great. <laughs> so uh, why don't you tell us the best advice you've ever received? That's our final question. 
Oh, man. God, I feel like I should have saved that last one for this. <laughs> I know, it's pretty good. Now you have to come up with something better. I always like to, sp- to kind of spring that up on people because it's like, if not, they prepare for it. And, my, and, and you know, the, the right question we should probably be asking is, is not what's the best advice you've ever received. It should be what's the best advice that's popping into your head right now that you can probably give, right? Because it's probably what you're going to share anyway. You know what I mean? Yeah. Mm, okay. I will say uh, I used to kind of tell a story in uh, one of my like motivational talks and it has a cool point to it. Um, it's all like perspective is everything, right? And everybody, like you have your own unique perspective. Um, I know whenever I was cheering at Clemson, I was really worried that Clemson University wouldn't want to have a quote unquote cheerleader who's blind. Like that's obviously a liability. Um, in cheerleading, you're throwing people around, you're catching people, you're tumbling, like all this stuff on national television, right? Um, so that could just be a bad thing. So I was really worried that Clemson would not be okay with that. Um, luckily they were, and we were able to work through it. But like when I was down there um, cheering, I had a lot of a lot of like news and press that were really interested of like how I was a cheerleader and how I was blind and cheered and things like that. And so uh, this one time I had a reporter ask me, how do you know when to cheer? And I kind of like laughed and I was like, what do you mean? And she was like, I mean, everyone else can see when like the touchdown pass is caught or like they make the winning basket, but you can't see those things. So like, how do you know when to cheer? And that's when I realized like, okay, I I don't have the vision to see those things, but I can probably more than anyone in that stadium feel the roar of the crowd and I can hear every single thing that's going on. I'm so aware of the announcers and my teammates and the people on the sidelines. Um, And that's my own unique perspective. And everybody has that. You don't have to be blind to have that perspective. And I think it can really give a lot of value to how you go about life and how you make decisions, how you create businesses that are different and stand out from other people. So channel your perspective and really use it to your advantage. I got to tell you this. I'm so glad you're you're going to be episode one of our, our new uh, Big Break 2.0 because this was fantastic. <laughs> this was a fantastic conversation. Oh, and I you. appreciate you being on here. <laughs> yeah, For th- sure. Rafa, I told you we were going to bring the heat, man. Yeah, man, yeah. this is this was awesome. <laughs> well, I hope you guys can share it with me. I want to share it too. Yeah, for absolutely. Sure. So you know, I guess now, I mean, any final questions? I mean, that's it. We've talked about everything you've done in your life. I appreciate it. We'd like to keep it at an hour. Um, I mean, if there's anything specific you want to bring up, now's the time for our listeners and our viewers that that you might want them to know about yourself, or that you you might have something coming up. And lastly, where can they find you um, and reach out to you and get to know a little bit more about you? Yeah. Um, so for, I'll give you all the social medias, um, cause there's so many different things, but my personal like social media is all under blind fit girl. Um, so you can find me there if you want to follow the booty shop, which I highly recommend you do because the content there is even better than the content I put out. Uh, but it's booty shop fitness. My real estate endeavors are G V L like Greenville. So it's G V L dwelling. Um, And then I also have a podcast. It's very small. I need to really work on rebooting it. But if you guys would like, y'all can send me this episode and I can cross promote it, put it on mine and highlight you guys and go on and share the episode if y'all want. Yeah, let's do it. That'd be awesome. Yeah. That'd be cool. Erica, thank you so much for coming on the show. We appreciate you. This was honestly a fantastic conversation. Um, And I would love to go deeper into some of these things that you're doing. But we want to be respectful of everybody's time. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here. Uh, And if you need to, you got all the social medias. We'll post it down below. Uh, We love you for staying here, sticking around, and we'll see you on the next one.